Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast out every Friday that dives into the progressive campaigns and issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And as you know, this is December, so we're doing our annual recap of all of the politics. We've uh, This is our first one. Uh, we're going to do one on federal politics, which is today. We're going to do one on state politics, which will be with Harriet Shing. We're going to do one on international politics and affairs with David Kitching, and we're going to do one on pop culture with Tess Farrell, um, just because... We imagine that you'll be at the beach by the time you listen to that episode and you probably don't want to think about politics, but you wouldn't mind getting some recommendations of some TV shows to binge whilst you're on the summer holidays with the kids. So today's episode is our first of our annual recaps. It's our third time we've done it with uh, the wonderful and talented and upcoming and inspiring leaders of our Labor Party caucus in, in Canberra, Annika Wells, the member for Lily, and Josh Burns, the member for McNamara, will be joining us on today's episode to recap the year of federal politics um, and what a great year it has been for the Labor Party uh, and Labor people that are at a federal level. So look out for that's going to be a great episode uh, today. And don't forget, if you uh, like the show, subscribe to Social Democratic on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favourite podcast app, and be sure to give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. And when you're done listening to the episode, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Podchaser. And for all the latest updates, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Okay, let's get to today's episode. We are taping this one on a Monday morning on the we do this to ourselves? the lands of the Nunnawal? Nunnawal. And and Nunnawal. Uh here in Canberra, in situ. Uh, it is our, um, this will go up in December, but I'm going to be honest with you out there, we're actually recording this literally uh, the weekend after Labor won a, a re-election in Victoria. Uh, but this is our Christmas sort of end of year, seasons, greetings, happy Hanukkah, uh, wrap up of the year. Um, we've done, this is the third time we've done this, but this is the first time we've actually done it in situ. It's pretty exciting. And I'm uh, in the office of Josh Burns, member for McNamara, and joined with me with Josh Burns is the Honourable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Annika Wells. So much has changed <laughs> since the three of us got together again. We are live, large and in charge. And it feels good. Yeah, absolutely. So, um... Uh, this time last year, we were, um, in, you guys were in opposition. Definitely were. Mm. <laughs> and, and now in government. Uh, Annika Wells, welcome back to Social Democratic. Always good to be with you. Josh. It's a real pleasure to be here with you both in person. The first time we've managed to achieve it in three years. <laughs> Josh Burns, welcome back to Social Democratic. And thank you for welcoming us into your wonderful office. Me casa, su casa, <laughs> Stephen. You're always welcome here in... A real place of hard work and yeah, collegiality like, as well here. Do, in people at McNamara have embassy rights here, like as yeah, 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 yeah. Office, yeah. If you're like a diplomatic community, if you're a, if you're a McNamara <laughs> and you're in Canberra during the sitting week, pop on in. You're welcome to come and have a look at the office. Yeah, once you get through the five levels of security. Oh yeah, we add an extra layer in just to <laughs> filter it out. Well, it just shows you how long it's been since I've been here in Parliament House that I just said to the cabbie, "Drop me off at the reps entrance," and I got there and it was like. There was this sort of Fort Knox many type. Many bollards. Many, um, many bollards. Yeah. Um, what's it called? The revolving door. But it was one of those oh, yeah, that really kind of aggressive ones. The one. fence. The fence would have come in since yep. you can't roll down the hill anymore. Tragic. Mm. You can't tread all over the uh, place of democracy. You can on certain hills. The top, yeah. Yeah, the top hill. Um, but the, that was the way the building was designed, that you could walk all over our elected officials. Yeah. But uh, now you just have to respectfully walk around them. <laughs> 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 and not be a security threat, which kind of loses a little bit of the sort of symbolism. Yeah. You may respectfully walk around <laughs> on a path. You may uh, throw a meaningful glare in yeah, our direction. Yeah, which is quite a Canberra thing, you know? Like, no, you can't, because of the new security restrictions, you can no longer walk o over the democratic institution. You may respectfully walk around <laughs> on a path. Well, it's also very Canberra, because Canberra just is just chock full of roundabouts, so that's just yeah. one more roundabout to go around, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, everything, Canberra just a, a big round about that's what it is but with lovely trees and a few museums and some courts yeah, yeah yeah so we're going to do what we normally do which is some way it's somehow we're going to try and unpack the year that was mm -hmm. 2022 mm -hmm. um i was trying to think what happened in between the start of the year and the actual election 
Because yeah. it just felt like an election, the whole build up to it, mm. right? When was yes. it going to be called? When was it going to mm. be called? Before we dive into the election itself, mm. what, Annika, your recollections of things that happened before the election that comes to Omicron. mind? Omicron. So the whole January, we were in Omicron and we, no one could get a hand on a rat for love mm. nor money. Mm. So I was doing literally rat run mm. each day where we were literally calling chemists and supermarkets and asking if they had rats in stock and putting up a grid each day of where you could get them. Um, people were queuing for tests, remember that? See how you've blocked it from your memory? Um, February for us were the floods, obviously massive floods um, through Queensland and parts of the rest of the country and that, that consumed us for what feels like all of February into March. And then, yeah, I think you're right. We had one more, we had sittings here in March, right? Because we had, um, we had the Ukraine session, remember? Mm. That was pretty cool. Um, and then we were off and racing, I think. That's my memory. Joshua? Uh, well, I remember in, in the Omicron wave, I was in Queensland actually, <laughs> on a, you know, trying to get a break before the election and got COVID and ended up in hotel quarantine. So I was in a hotel quarantine on Broad Beach with this perfect Queensland weather, watching everyone outside have a holiday. And while well, I was stuck inside with my daughter uh, with COVID. So that was great. Uh, but no, I, I, my big recollection of the early part of the year was Morrison's religious discrimination bill. That was something where we had an all night sitting yes. and Morrison was trying to basically bugger over his his you know, moderate liberals uh, by uh, trying to get us to do a deal with him. Uh, it's just natu in the naturally, we, we have divisions as part of this uh, podcast, the Senate's bells are ringing. And then we had this late night sitting for the, you know, five Liberal Party members to end up at about 3.30 in the morning voting with us to protect kids from being discriminated against, uh, which caused Scott Morrison to pull his entire bill uh, and then shortly after, Morrison then pre-selected Catherine Deves uh, in the seat of Warringah. So it was this constant sort of culture war being waged by the former Prime Minister. And I think that was, I think, a really energising and made you feel really determined that we, like, we had to get rid of this, this bloke. And that... And then, then we had the election. But the, the other, the other, yeah, Annika touched on it. We, we had this constant, this constant speculation about when Scott Morrison will call the election. And he couldn't call it in November in 2021 because he hadn't organised enough vaccinations. And then he couldn't call it in uh, for March because he hadn't organised the, the rapid antigen tests. So it was kind of pushed back, pushed back, not by vaccines. Yeah, vaccines. yeah, exactly. So um, he, it was it was kind of constantly being pushed back by the fact that he wasn't doing a particularly good job. Can I stick with you just for a moment, Josh? Yeah. When you did talk, uh, when you mentioned the the anti discriminate the anti religious discrimination legislation that they tried to bring in, it kind of felt like that was a last ditch play by Morrison to try and wedge sections of the Labor voting base. Now, what I like about having you two guys on the show was that you actually are from vastly different parts of the country, but also mm. different types of electorates as yeah. well. When that happened for you, and I'll come to you in a moment, Anna, and I want to get your reflections as a Queenslander, how did you, did you, were you worried about that or what was going through your minds as a marginal seat holder? Oh, totally. I mean, there were two key aspects. One was that Morrison put in a conventional anti-discrimination bill, which, which frankly, there is a need for a, an update of our discrimination framework. So people who are of a religious faith are not discriminated against. The most obvious examples and the most frequent examples of that are uh, Islamic women wearing hijabs, Sikh men wearing turbans, uh, Jewish people in my electorate of McNamara wearing yarmulkes. There's been a spike in anti-Semitic incidents being reported. So there are, there are examples where protecting people from discrimination is absolutely a legitimate and important reform, and we're gonna we're gonna do a we're gonna update our discrimination framework uh, probably sometime next year uh, to pr better protect people from discrimination. The problem with Scott Morrison's bill was he had all of these extra clauses that undermined existing protections against discrimination, not just federally but in a lot of state jurisdictions as well, and. That really made a lot of people who were discriminated on the basis of their sexuality or gender identity are really, really nervous. And 
yeah, Morrison chose to do it in a way that was really divisive and he didn't need to. Had he just left it as a way in which would protect people from discrimination, then I think he would have had the support of pretty much everyone in the parliament. Uh, even, you know, even the Equality Australia groups and other advocates like that would have, would have supported that. Uh, he didn't. He went to his culture wars and his, uh, and his really divisive games and in the end he wedged himself because his own Liberal members couldn't support the sort of really cruel and, uh, and yeah, potentially discriminatory piece of legislation that he was enabling. Anika, how did you think it was going to play out in your part of the world? Mm, Well, firstly, I should say Josh should get acknowledged for all the work that he did behind the scenes on that, which um, doesn't... that That's how these decisions are changed, and that's... Like, people are one by one, one one-to-one conversations, and that was, you know, Josh behind the scenes doing that, um, doing that work to get the outcome that we all wanted. I actually think that um, episode in Australian politics was an interesting one to reflect upon the nature of the 24-7 media cycle, because... I mean, we have processes within the Labor Party. We had um, caucus committee, then we had caucus. The, the now PM, then opposition leader, called the play, um, directed how we were going to execute the play. The play was going to take 36 hours, essentially. And he called it correctly. It, um, he got the outcome that we sought with the assistance of people like Josh. But for that 36 hours, it was pretty horrendous on social media as everybody who wanted the outcome that we sought saw it playing out kind of minute by minute, hour by hour across the different news outlets. And um, I think people were wanting us to act more strongly, more defiantly, more instantly, but you know, the opposition leader then had called a play per his knowledge of parliamentary procedure, which ultimately is, is what worked. So I know my office was absolutely deluged by people who care about this issue, who thought we weren't going hard enough, strong enough, fast enough, but ultimately we got the outcome that we'd sought. And I think in the olden days where they would have just had, uh, where the update would have been a daily newspaper, it probably would have been a very different experience for everyone. Mm. But Mm. the nature of the transparent, you know, you can watch Parliament live, Mm. every talking heads popping up every 10 minutes on various outlets to it, it espoused where we're up to at that moment in time, made for a different and actually I think more traumatic experience for people. Let's turn to the federal election. Eventually was called. Annika, share with us your uh, feelings heading into that campaign. You were in a marginal seat in the Lily. Um, you were, this is your sophomore campaign. Yes. Um, for both of you, actually. Yes. Um, what were your expectations of Labor's chances and your own chances in Lily? Um, I, I think, um, I mean, I spent the whole of my first term... Um, fearing for my life. When, you, when you're on a 0.65% margin, it does feel every every bad event or week in politics is, is going to be the one that finishes you off. Um, so I tried to work really hard across the three years. But for me, I think the tipping point was when Scott Morrison decided not to go to COP26. And do you remember he really ummed and ahed about it? He wasn't mm. going, he was going, he wasn't going, he wasn't, he wasn't going. He had the option of going um, or not going. And if he didn't go, the, the rumours were he was going to call the election. And we were all told, prepare for a late November election. Um, and just think of that sliding doors moment. If he had not gone and called the election, things were in a very different... Like, the landscape looked very different in late November than where it looked by May this year. And he went to COP and he got called a liar by Macron. And I really think that was the tipping point for ordinary Australians who might not follow the, the week-to-week of what's happening in Parliament. But the French president calling our prime minister a liar, I don't think I know, Mm. really was for some people the kind of, right, this bloke's got to go. And from there, we went into Omicron, people, you know, and and again, on Scott Morrison, told everyone we're going to have a brilliant summer, don't listen to us Mm. naysayers in opposition. You know, everyone's going to have this brilliant summer that they deserved. People didn't have a brilliant summer. People had a, you know, terrible summer um, because of Omicron. Then we went into floods. Obviously, the experience for us was that the government didn't act. They felt like the government wasn't there to support them in some key ways that the federal government looks after when it comes to natural disasters. Um, and then we went into the election. Um, so it felt like from that moment when Macron said, I don't think I know, to May 21, 
we were on the rise and people that had kind of kept their reservations or given Scott Morrison every chance because Australians are a fair and reasonable people, wrote him off across summer. What's your margin now? 10.5. Bang. <laughs> Josh, yourself, same experience. You had to wait a little bit longer to find out whether or not you got your job back. Look, despite what my staff might say, I remain... I maintain that I was cool, calm and collected throughout the entire count in McNamara. Uh, no, it was, it, McNamara was a really hard fought contest. And yeah, this, at the federal election, there was really the rise of another force in politics, which was the independent movement, uh, which we should talk about a bit later in the Victorian context, because they may have lost everything in the Victorian election. But federally, what they were really seen as was an was a, a another method in order to remove Scott Morrison, and so there was this coalition of groups of politics who you know who were potentially going to remove Scott Morrison. The Greens throughout the pandemic were really struggling for relevance, but then cottoned on to this sentiment that, well, if you're if you're against Morrison, then you can maybe tap into that independent vote, and I and and the Greens ran a really smart campaign. In, especially in places like mine, where they, you know, in, for the lack of an independent, they were not running a campaign based on some of their more fringe policies. They were running, you know, basically like, I'll be your voice, I'll be your independent voice. And it was a far more local and sensible campaign. And they tapped into, they tapped into that force. And I think they did a really good job, which pushed us to, you know, pushed us to a pretty close count in McNamara. So I think we have to be humble about that, to be honest. But in saying that, you know, we did we did get a swing towards us in McNamara, which I'm really pr proud of, and we did finish first in the primaries, which is the first time in in my electorate that we've done that since 2010, which was the Julia Gillard high watermark in Victoria. Uh, so, you know, and and then we ended up having once we were clearly ahead of the Greens on on the three CP, we ended up the Liberals. We won every single booth in McNamara, which is we ha we haven't done that. Our two PP is as big as we've ever had it. Um, so the Liberal Party really dealt themselves out of the contest, which was, um, which was you know, an unusual aspect given they, they hold um, two of the four seats at a state level that my electorate, uh, that can, that's within my electorate. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think that for many young people especially, they had never seen what a federal Labor government looks like and... I think we have an opportunity and we've done so in the first six months with some extraordinary reforms already, obviously climate change, uh, domestic violence legislation, uh, domestic violence leave uh, passed through legislation, childcare reforms, uh, as well as this week we're going to pass the National Anti-Corruption Commission and Fair Work, the, you know, the Better Pay, Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill. Uh, it's It's... I think I think hopefully people are seeing that actually having a Labor government is important, and uh, and you know we, we we can provide good leadership for people right across the country. In saying that, I think I think there's a lot of challenges to go for us to hold on long term, but I think we made a strong start. So yeah, in McNamara, I think my what I get post election was look, we voted Greens, but we're actually really happy with the result, and there is a real sense of relief. And and you know and we're you know we're with you and and that's that's a good feeling. So yeah, it was it was a, a fascinating political political election and landscape in McNamara in the in the federal election. It was a, a tight seat and a hard fought seat, uh, but we won it. Annika, so we formed government, mm. and uh, then you're in the ministry, <laughs> um, mentally preparing yourself for that. How much time did you have? Like, obviously, first of all, you just want to win your seat, right? And mm -hmm. then second of all, you want hope to God mm -hmm. that you're, you know, the government's elected. Yes. But now all of a sudden you're a minister. So yes. how do you get yourself ready for that? And then how do you start to think forward about what you want to achieve in, in the areas that you've yeah. been given? Well, it, there was very little time. It wasn't something that I expected um, at all. So therefore, um, had, had not prepared for, like you said, I was 100% focused on retaining Lily. Um, so I think there was, I'm counting, eight, nine days between that moment and being sworn in as minister. So I think, um, I mean, I, uh, 
I, I was a lawyer before getting elected. I'm a planner by nature. I sort of defaulted to it, like to my Trello board and tried to map out a bit of a hundred day plan and um, questions to ask, like what does the first day need to hold? What does the first week need to hold? What does the first month need to hold? And what does the first hundred days need to hold? Um, before I even had the portfolios, because some of those questions remain the same in terms of what you're asking from the department and what, um, is expected of you what we promised in the campaign you know if labor won in government so it was a bit of a hustle um obviously one that is welcomed in an honor and everyone wishes to be burdened with the hustle <laughs> of, of that experience i would say the biggest factor was that my family wasn't set up for it you know we were used to me being away 100 nights a year for parliament but largely in lily particularly because of the pandemic you know we hadn't done any travel mm with committees or delegations, like we'd largely been based at home and, and I had the twins, you know, who were at, uh, who were one. Um, so for my family to go from me being largely at home with sort of a parliament travel system that we had gotten used to, to me being away three, four, five days a week of the week in that first few months to get up and running was quite a shock. And um, I really relied upon everyone's goodwill um, to get us through it and um, people still ask, daily how do you do it and i don't have an answer yet it's still a bit of a scramble where what is it six months they're into not last even, week six months yeah, yeah. Really, okay there you go mm -hmm. uh oh, this new albanese labor government uh, annika to you first and i'll come to you josh in a moment mm -hmm. what uh what's been the highlights in terms of achievements that there's that has been mm -hmm. uh that albo and, and the team have managed to knock off already in the first six months um for me um being the aged care minister and the sports minister um, an aged care reform bill was the first bill to pass both mm. the House and the Senate, first bill through the Parliament. Um, we really had to hustle to make that happen. You'll see a theme emerging, hustle. Mm. <laughs> um, but to me, it was so important to demonstrate that we really meant business about reforming aged care. I know standing at pre-poll for two weeks straight in the rain, um, that was one of the top three issues that people cared about. And, and ordinary people that did not give a fig about the red team and the blue team um, just wanted to see something done about aged care. So mm. I really felt that burden. I don't think I slept for the first two or three nights um, when I was given the portfolio with just the, the that sense of responsibility falling on my shoulders. So to be the first bill through the parliament was a massive effort, but I'm very proud of it. And since then, we've actually passed a second aged care reform bill, um, which is the one that substantively delivers our election commitments. So um, increasing the number of care minutes that residents in aged care facilities will receive. 24-7 nurses, which was the big promise um, that people knew about at the election campaign, which is that um, every residential aged care facility will have to have a nurse on duty 24-7. Um, and the final one in the aged care space, I would say, is pay rise for aged care workers, mm. which I think in the first 36 hours on the job, I was still in my um, MP office here on the rep side, had to write the letter to Fair Work um, in support of a pay rise for aged care workers to meet the deadlines. And um, a couple of weeks ago, Fair Work Commission came through with an interim 15% pay rise and, and perhaps more to come. So lots, lots on and lots done in aged care in the first six months. And then for sport, um, obviously there's been some rolling scandals in sport this year, and there's been a real emergence of the athlete's voice and the role that the athlete has to play in Australian sport and the Australian sporting ecosystem. So we have implemented some world leading um, reforms which were actually recommended by the AHRC in the gymnastics report, but just ne no one did anything about them, where there's now a hotline you can call if you're at all in the sporting ecosystem. You don't have to be an athlete. You can be a coach. You can be a parent. You can be, a, hmm. um, you can be an official. You can be a volunteer. And you can call and say, look, there's this abuse of power happening. What can I do? And they'll step you through the options, formal and informal, refer you to counselling if you need it, like a real triage system. Um, because... Um, the complaints keep rolling in and we're going to do something about it. Josh, for you, the first six months. Uh, I'm going to make a general observation, which I think has changed under the leadership of Anthony Albanese, which is the tone of politics. I think that under Morrison, he was a prime minister who did seek to divide the country. And Anthony, it, it, the way that he's helped shape the government and the way that we're working is really to actually be more focused on the reforms, some of which Annika has pointed out that she's leading in, you know, doing a brilliant job in the aged care portfolio and sport. 
but it's also across all of the different portfolios about the way which we work in, in the parliament with respect across the parliament. I actually think Australians wanted us to be more collaborative and more constructive after the election. And I think that's the first observation, is that the, actually the whole feel of politics in the first six months of the Labor government has changed compared to the quite vindictive and divisive way in which the former Prime Minister ran the country. And I think the way that that's manifested as well in some key reforms, uh, it, it shows that actually you can get things done and the climate change bill mm. was was massive. And, you know, if we're going to get to 43% emission reduction, people and people... People forget how big a job that actually is. You know, everyone hails the Rudd Gillard years as the sort of bastion of climate action. Well, they they reduced Australia's emissions by about eleven percent in those six years, and we're going to need to do about triple that in the next seven and a half years. Mm. And that's, you know, that's it's it's the biggest, it's the biggest um, decarbonisation project. You know, in our country's history, and and it's it's going to take a lot of work, and we're going to have to be very disciplined about how we get there. So that's something that, you know, and and obviously we don't want to just get to forty three. We want to be able to do as much as we possibly can. So that's that's a big reform, and that's requiring a lot of work. And yeah, but I'm I'm really I'm really proud of that. And just just yeah. on that, Josh, it's you know, for a long time we sort of thought that climate was like the third rail of Australian politics. No one wanted to touch it, so much mm. from our side. Mm. Mm. Have we moved past that now? I feel like there's more confidence within the caucus and more broadly within the public debate about climate. Well, not only did we see it at the federal election where no one lost a seat, no one lost a seat to someone who was advocating for lower climate targets. No one. Mm. It, it, out of the 151 seats, where they changed hands, it was always to someone who advocated for more and stronger climate targets, which tells you something, um, that the Australian people are open to strong climate targets and strong climate policy. And the other, the other piece of evidence that I would point out is that actually at the Victorian election, the Victorian Labor government has just put forward not only the most clim ambitious climate policy in Australia, but the most... I don't think there's another developed state that is pushing for an 85% emission reduction by 2035. It, it's, it's, as far as I'm aware, the most ambitious climate policy ever taken to an election by a government uh, anywhere in the world, which is pretty extraordinary. And, you know, if, if you haven't, if you've missed it, Victoria did okay, Victorian Labor did okay at the election. So I, I, I and, and, you know, and the Greens didn't slam it at all. They didn't say anything about it. And no one held them to account on that. I found it well, fascinating. The Greens, the Greens in the Victorian election, I've, I've looked over the numbers closely, as I tend to, in Green Labor seats. Had it not been for Matthew Guy, the Greens, I think, would have lost a seat at this election. I think we win the seat of Melbourne had the Greens preference Labor over the Greens. Had the, had the Liberals not preferenced the Greens over Labor, uh, yeah, you know, I, I I hope Matthew Guy's on Samantha Ratnam's Christmas card list because he, he he did them a big help in Richmond and Melbourne, which I think were two seats that probably would have fallen to Labor. So anyway, coming back to climate, I, I I think that I think that what we've grown in confidence in is that we can we can talk about climate confidently as Labor people. We know it's going to be good for the economy. We know that in areas like the Hunter, where we hold literally all of the seats across the Hunter that people are looking for new industry and new job opportunities and that they think that we're a better shot at being able to bring those new industries and new jobs to their communities uh, and that we're honest about some of the challenges that, that they those communities face while being strong advocates for the workers who are in, in their jobs, uh, as well as we can be confident around the country that actually this could be a jobs and economic bonanza for Australia and that we can we can turn this into a good news story. One of the big, well, the number one issue that voters um, had indicated in research in leading up to the federal election was cost of living. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a budget in um, out of season. It was in mm. last month. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> October. <laughs> These last couple of weeks have been a bit of a blur. Uh, how, if you're reflecting on the last six months, Annika, how is Labor going in dealing with this issue that 
is not an easy one to, you can't just flick a switch and fix the cost of living. There's so many sort of pressures, both domestically and internationally on, mm. on, on prices. How are we going there? Reflecting on the year so far, what have we yeah. achieved? I think it's, it's a harder conversation for us to have because we are just not prepared to do the kind of sugar hit um, fixes that Scott Morrison was. Like the, I'm thinking of the fuel excise levy, the six month you know, sugar hit that he put down that we let expire as planned on our watch, um, the the transition from uh, literally swinging day to day, um, short term fixes, whatever will respond best to News Corp front pages, to trying to have a more sensible long term approach isn't easy, um, but it's what we're doing. And cost of living was like you say, it was an issue back in the election, March April. Um, it's even more of an issue now because of the way that bills are going um, and mortgages are going. But I think, I think two things. Firstly, people want to know that we really are trying our best. Like I think people are sensible about the fact, like you say, there's no silver bullet. They appreciate not being um, spun about that anymore mm. by the new government, but also that we are doing things that ultimately will make it easier as fast as we, as fast as we possibly can. And um, to talk about, we have disparate electorates, but the same issues, the way that I've always talked about climate change in Lilly is about green jobs. And I know this is something you talk about, like we have the opportunity, this can be for Australia what oil was for Saudi Arabia in terms mm. of renewable jobs, given our um, natural born assets and abilities here in Australia. Um, manufacturing, Lilly is sort of, um, was a, a proud manufacturing hub in decades gone. That's kind of been declining across the years, they want to see it back. The best way to do that is for us to be a renewables um, powerhouse and to do those kinds of things. Those are measures we are putting in, like we're doing it. Mm. And I think locally people hopefully are seeing that, but I agree with you week to week, you know, the insider's montage isn't going to deliver the same kind of sugar hit that Morrison used to oversee. And sticking with jobs then, Tony Burke in the last couple of weeks has been on fire, certainly in the parliament. He's uh, loving it. Yeah, and, and clearly <laughs> loving it. And you can tell he's a former <laughs> uh, union organiser because he just knows his shit, you know. He got a couple of questions in question time last week that were sort of, you know, is it going to happen? Will it impact on this type of work in this type of situation, this small mm. business? And he just was I'm like... I'm glad you asked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Josh, from the caucus perspective, um, how are how's the team feeling mm. coming into the end of the year? This is, this is the last week, sitting week, is it for you guys? Is yeah, right? so they tell us. We will yeah. roll into Saturday. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it's hard. Because obviously the industrial relations uh, legislation, uh, I haven't really been following that much because I've been obviously my mind elsewhere at the moment. But uh, just talk us through how we're feeling about that and some of the achievements that the caucus has made in the last... Yeah. Last, last little while. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely think the mood's really strong in the team. I think... There is an amazing group of new MPs who got elected in 2022. And I think the Labor Party is as diverse and as multicultural and as, as, as experienced as any Labor caucus in the history of our country. And I think that our cabinet also is, is more reflective of that. Uh, and that's a really good thing. And it's going to lead us into having good disagreements, which is going to be really important for us being a long-term government. Uh, but but I also think that people have a real. Well, just, no, just, just, no, just the, Apologies for the four minutes of bells you're about to. <laughs> crazy cats in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> I think it must be scones time. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> scones and tea time in the Senate. Yeah, that's their call. Uh, but um, but they they um, but the, the feeling's good. And on on industrial relations, I think this is you know this is what people expect and no Labor governments need to deliver. And, and you can't think of, there literally was not one piece of meaningful industrial relations reform in the 10 years of the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government. Mm. And there was nothing, nothing that lifted wages, nothing that gave people any structural change to be able to have more power at the enterprise bargaining table. And that's got to change because we've seen too many people not being able to find some level of financial security in this country. Housing is less affordable. The bills are stacking up. Businesses are actually doing pretty well. Productivity is not bad. Uh, there's a low unemployment, yet we're not seeing that, that consistent rise in wages. 
and we need to tip the balance a little bit and use the levers of government. And that's what Labor governments do. They do things to try and ensure that working people are able to lead a better life in this country. And I'm really proud of Tony. He's done a great job. We're going to get this thing through. We've secured an agreement with David Pocock. And once the Greens realised that sensible people had done a deal, they had to fall in behind of it uh, as well. And yeah, this is going to be this is going to be one of the things that we look back on and go, that was a good moment where we made meaningful reform and this is what Labor governments are all about. Wrapping up, um, as we always do, we have our awards, our Social Democratic Awards. Remember, we did a, you have to nominate your uh, Caucus Member of the Year, MVP, mm. and mm. as well as your Social Democrat of the Year, which is a non-politician. It's normally a good opportunity for you guys to shout out some of the people that you love. Mm -hmm. And I'm patting this question right now because I don't think you remembered that I was going to do this and I'm giving you the opportunity to come away and think about who you want to yep. put that award to and Annika's got a very confident look on her face yeah. so I'm going to ask you first. <laughs> very yeah. good. Go Annika. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Social Democrat of the Year, a um, couple of shout outs, Danelle Wallen and her colleagues at um, the Opals I think. There's been a lot of discussion in sport this year, we touched on it earlier about um, the athlete, the role of the athlete, the rights of the athlete. And they have really come up against it. News Corp, you know, sports washing. Athletes should just be grateful anyone's prepared to, you know, pay any money into their sport. Um, but they have stood, I think, for progressive social democratic values. They, mm -hmm. um, Danelle stood by her values. And it was, you know, what she went through was very difficult. Um, and her teammates stuck by her. Um, and I think they should all be applauded for it. And, um, you know, Victorian Labor government cavalry rode in um and and i understand that there was actually heaps of competition for who would um who would sponsor the opals because people want to back mm. people who stand with values um i'd also acknowledge to that end the socceroos god bless them for acting as a team and living by their values um i think i certainly as the sports minister can't believe my luck best job in australia but i really want to stand by athletes um, and their rights their right to bargain their rights for better paying conditions and their rights to speak up on issues that matter to them. So they are my Social Democrats of the Year. I give Social Democrats of the Year to a couple of people. Uh, incredible effort, Katie Hobbs defeating Kari Lake uh, for the governorship of Arizona. Uh, a good, and anyone who took on a, a an anti-democratic American Republican and, and defeated them. That was an extraordinary result, as well as the Philadelphia, so, uh, the, the Pennsylvania Democratic team of, of uh, John Fetterman and, and Josh Shapiro, who uh, held a really difficult bellwether state for the Democrats over the midterms. And Josh Shapiro is one to watch. Uh, he's an he's a orator who models himself on the Obama way of speaking, and he's actually a very impressive public speaker and is a rising star in American politics. So I'd I'd say well done to the Democrats who were able to hold off, especially against candidates who were seeking to push conspiracy theories and, and you know, anti-democratic messages. We need a strong America. And I think that it was an amazing result in the midterms. But the other, the other character I'd have to mention as a social Democrat would have to be Daniel Andrews, who, who won a third term in Victoria. And yeah, I worked for Daniel for four years and an extraordinary... Labor politician, but also a really bloody tough and resilient person and someone who has a lot of people screaming at him and he doesn't panic and he just took a deep breath and thought his way through another election in Victoria. And everyone called the last one a Dan slide. Well, it looks like there might be another, or we might end up on exactly the same number of seats or maybe one or two less. And after eight years in power, potentially having 24 of the last 28 years in power, it's a remarkable achievement. It's a dynasty. I love that. A dynasty. It is. A dynasty. Dynasty. A dan very good. Uh, did you, any, That's what I just said. Any, uh, <laughs> any, uh, says it. that was oh, yeah. Annika. Josh says it. Annika Bring it. <laughs> oh, what a marvellous <laughs> cracking joke there. Thank and, you, Josh. <laughs> and, and on that note, because uh, you both have to run off because you're very, very busy people. Um, Annika Wells, thank you very much for your time today and coming on the show and you're supporting the podcast over the last uh, 12 months. It's been a I only wish we could do double the time. Mm. 
Caucus member of the year, quickly. Go, you got to do oh, it. Oh, I was going to give it to Sharon again, but I already gave it to her last year. Sharon Clayton, such a bloody legend. Mm. Um, class of 2022, like mm. you said, they're dynamic, they're agile, they're excited, they're shiny faced, they're carrying handbags into the chambers. They're mm. a bunch of groundbreakers. <laughs> We love them. Yeah, well, I would go. I would go one level of especially uh, Louise in Boothby and Michelle and Higgins of winning seats that we've never won before yes. in the history. And also, have we? I don't think we've ever won Tangney as well. Sam Lim. I don't think we've ever won it. Mm. Um, so anyone who won a seat that we've never won in the history oh, of the Labor we, Party, we love you. You, and you we get thank you. MVP. You get you get the cookies. Yeah, this year. Very good. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your time today. I really do appreciate it. Best of uh, luck with the remaining days of this sitting week. Have a great Christmas, Hanukkah, season's greetings, all the rest. And we look forward to seeing you guys kick ass in 2023. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Annika. Always a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Socially Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcast or Podchaser. And to get all the latest on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday. Socially Democratic was brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Morris Blackburn Lawyers have spent more than a century paving the hard path to justice for everyday Australians. They've helped over 500,000 Australians turn their situation around and they know how the system works. Their experience and skills means you'll get the best results possible. Find out more on their website, morrisblackburn.com.au. Morris Blackburn, experience you can count on.